Uh, we have the honor to have the director of the Telecommunication Standardization Bureau, Mr. Malcolm Johnson, who has a tight schedule today. He, he needs to leave early. So we would like to start with your keynote speech, uh, Malcolm. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Stefano. And uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, ITU workshop on accessibility. To those in, in the room and also uh, those uh, following uh, remotely with the uh, captioning, which has been very kindly sponsored by uh, ISOC. Well, ITU uh, and, uh, and, and its membership um, recognize uh, the, uh, the uh, in order to achieve uh, our, uh, our mission of uh, connecting the world, um, we need to address the needs of 10% of the global population, uh, those with disabilities. And so access uh, to ICTs for persons with disabilities has been a key feature of ITU's work, especially over uh, the course of uh, 2008. Um, the World uh, Telecommunications and Information Society Day uh, this year had the title uh, Connecting Persons with Disabilities, ICT Opportunities for All. This initiative uh, helped to raise uh, the awareness of the incredible potential of ICTs to extend the capabilities uh, of persons with disabilities. And uh, this year we established in ITU uh, a new group to coordinate all our uh, standardization activity on accessibility and human factors. It's called a joint coordination activity, and it's open to uh, any expert to participate. And uh, the intention is to, of course, uh, improve access to uh, the information society for people with um, disabilities. We are very pleased that the, uh, the coordinator of this group Andrea Sachs uh, was recognized by the World Telecommunications and Inf Information Society Day as uh, one of the three uh, laureates, along with uh, DAISY Corporation and uh, the First Lady of, of Egypt, uh, Mrs. Mubarak. In addition, uh, ITU took the initiative to establish the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and disabilities, uh, which will meet uh, for the first time during this uh, IGF. Uh, recently, uh, we held uh, the first uh, ITU uh, Global Standardization Symposium in Johannesburg in October, where we had uh, leaders of industry, uh, uh, government ministers, um, heads of regulatory bodies, and uh, heads of uh, standardization bodies uh, speaking. And um, it was recognized there that uh, accessibility to, to ICTs was a, a major enabler uh, to economic and social development, especially significant since uh, there's a high percentage of uh, persons with disabilities in the developing countries, um, poor people especially. This event was followed uh, in Johannesburg by the ITU's World Telecommunications Standardization Assembly. And uh, this uh, conference adopted uh, the historic uh, resolution, the first uh, ITU resolution on accessibility, which mandated uh, ITU to uh, document uh, best practice, review its services and facilities for accessibility, and uh, to work on programs to progress accessibility in developing countries. Standards, of course, uh, play an enormously uh, important role in uh, making ICTs more accessible. And it's important that uh, accessibility requirements are taken into account right at the start of uh, developing a standard 
because it can be very uh, difficult to adapt equipment um, retrospectively and of course that's also very expensive to do. So we've developed uh, in ITU an uh, accessibility checklist for uh, standards developers to, to take into consideration at the beginning of work on a new standard. Uh, this checklist is, is available on our website. So ITU is, is leading uh, in terms of international standards uh, uh, attempts to, to reach the goal of um, accessibility. In fact, uh, ITU was the first standards body to, to address accessibility issues back in 1991. And uh, in 1994, we published uh, the first uh, standard uh, on accessibility. It was the um, recommend ITUT recommendation V.18, which um, was the international text telephone standard, um, bringing together the text telephone protocols that uh, uh, were previously incompatible into uh, a harmonized uh, standard. And uh, since then, IT ITU's uh, accessibility experts have helped to incorporate accessibility uh, needs into standards for multimedia, uh, network interoperability, uh, teleconferencing, and uh, most importantly, next generation networks, in including IPTV, and uh, created the concept of uh, total conversation with, with real-time text. And th this year we held a, a joint forum with the G3 ICT uh, back in April on uh, how ICTs can help to um, meet the requirements of the UN Convention on, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we held um, regional workshops on, on the same topic um, in Kenya and in Zambia. And we'll be holding more of these uh, workshops uh, next year. And as with uh, all ITU workshops, they're, they're open to anyone to, to attend and uh, they're free of charge. And uh, we webcast most of these uh, workshops so people can follow them remotely without going to the expense of uh, traveling to them. And uh, we've also developed in ITUD uh, guidelines for mainstreaming ICT accessibility issues. Uh, we catalogue uh, commercially available accessibility technologies that enable uh, access to ICTs and it considers the uh, socio-economic uh, barriers that uh, limit uh, their worldwide availability. This is also available uh, free on, on our website. ITU and G3 ICT are, are developing an online toolkit for policymakers, regulators, and other stakeholders to develop policies and strategies ad addressing accessibility in line with the UN Convention. We also have a number of projects to uh, equip schools and uh, multi-purpose community telecenters with uh, assistive devices such as uh, braille printers to extend ICT services to persons with disabilities. So you'll see um, I, accessibility is, is a priority for ITU and uh, we're committing to uh, addressing this important issue um, in partnership with, with many other organizations such as those we have uh, speaking here this morning uh, and many uh, very dedicated uh, experts, um, people involved in accessibility uh, 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 tremendously uh, devoted to the work and put in uh, tremendous uh, effort. I'm very pleased that we have such uh, excellent speakers here with us today. I'd like to thank them for uh, their participation. Unfortunately, uh, Andrea Sachs uh, cannot be uh, with us due to uh, illness, but I'm sure uh, she's up early in the morning in the, the UK and uh, we'll be following the captioning. So I wish uh, Andrea uh, well. I hope she uh, will soon be back uh, with us 
because we need uh, the tremendous effort she puts into this work. So um, I'd just like to thank again all the speakers and uh, organizers and uh, members of the uh, steering committee for this uh, event. I hope you uh, find it uh, a rewarding workshop and thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you very much, Malcolm, to, to be with us and for this keynote. We know you are very busy and uh, another workshop is waiting for you. Um, I, I would like uh, to... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least that, yes. Um, we, I would like to join you thanking Andrea uh, Sachs, that uh, was really a very important person, a key person to organize this workshop, putting together such a high-level panel of speakers. And uh, she's uh, online, definitely. I just received an SMS from her. <laughs> and she was complaining that the sound is not uh, very well uh, done in a uh, in webcast. She wanted to hear better. Um, but so, Andrea, we wish you uh, prompt recovery and come back working with us. And actually, Andrea sent uh, me a message she would like uh, me to read on her behalf. So I'm going to do that now. Um, Hello everyone, uh, I'm sorry that uh, due to ill health I can't be with you uh, at the IGF this time. I want to thank those of you who worked so hard on the steering committee to organize this IT workshop and especially the partners of the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability because we have organized this workshop, ITU has organized this workshop in collaboration with the Dynamic Coalition, that's how I just wanted to inform you. So to the speakers, I want to say that without your dedication and your determination to be here, now this event would not have happened. And I'm very proud of all of you. I want to personally thank uh, Cynthia Waddell to take my place and chairing the Dynamic Coalition meeting that will take place on Saturday, 6 December. And all of you are invited to attend uh, to this meeting. I wish I could be there. I will be reading the captions, so I will be with you in spirit. Have a great workshop and a great meeting. Well, Mr. God, Andrea. Okay, so <laughs> thank you, Andrea. I know you're hearing. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, we, uh, we are about to start uh, the workshop then. Uh, um, there is a web page where you can access the program, and um, some of the flyer was distributed uh, with the program as well. I want to thank again ISOC to providing the captioning. I'm aware that there is some problem with the captioning, unfortunately, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that the captioner in Canada can hear um, the, what, what has been said here to be able to caption. And we have also no internet connection in this room today, uh, so I can't contact her. Uh, so unfortunately, <laughs> there are problems, uh, but we have to cope with that. And we go ahead. Uh, I want to inform uh, who is present in the room that we have distributed uh, on the chair a form. And uh, if you have any kind of question, I would suggest you to write it down. And we are going to collect uh, all the questions at the end uh, of the workshop. This is because we might not have time today to answer to all the questions, but we will definitely answer to the question to the Dynamic Coalition meeting. So we collect them, and during the meeting on Saturday, again in the morning, uh, we will uh, also wrap up to this workshop and uh, have uh, some more interactive discussion. Okay, so I think we can start. And uh, according to the program, the first speaker is uh, Cynthia Waddell. I'm not going to introduce all of them because they are really high experts and all the bio of these people are available to be downloaded from the web page of this workshop. So if you are interested to know what these people have accomplished in their career on accessibility, and I tell you this is very interesting to, to read, just please access the accessibility web page of this workshop, which is also available from the flyers. And uh, you can download the bios, uh, the abstracts of the presentation, the presentation itself, and uh, uh, you will have also a photo of the speaker. Okay, so Cynthia uh, will give us a presentation on the UN Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, how does it impact the internet? Cynthia, uh, are you coming here? You will be I'm from. There. Oh. You. Yes. So the presentation is already online.
you can speak from here. Okay, if you prefer, that's okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and use it. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's a privilege to be here again. Uh, my, as you said, my name is Cynthia Waddell. I'm the executive director and law policy and technology uh, subject matter expert for the International Center for Disability Resources on the Internet. I also serve as the accessible ICT for government services expert for the United Nations Global uh, Initiative for Inclusive ICTs. I'm a person with a hearing disability and would have uh, appreciated the captioning uh, working today, but we'll, we'll do what we can. Uh, my presentation is a brief discussion on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. How does it impact the Internet? Today's discussion will address five topics concerning the Convention and how it impacts the Internet. The background of the Convention, equal access to the Internet, accessible web design and implementation, best practices in government and procurement, and resources available. So let's begin. The UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities was drafted with full participation of government and non-government entities representing persons with disabilities. It was adopted by the General Assembly on 13th of December 2006. The convention addresses the rights of 650 million persons with disabilities and impacts 2 billion persons, including family members of persons with disabilities around the world. It is the first human rights treaty of this millennium. It is especially relevant today because it contains provisions addressing the state's party's obligations with respect to the internet and persons with disabilities. On the 30th of March 2007, the convention opened for signature, and the number of signatories on opening day were the highest in history for a convention. As countries move to ratify the treaty, we are finding that it now has entered into legal force on May 3rd, 2008. As of the time I created this slide in November, there were 136 signatories to the convention and 79 to the optional protocol, which is the monitoring uh, provisions. For a visual representation of all the countries around the globe and their status with respect to the treaty, uh, I have provided a, a visual display of those countries by, that are color coded as to uh, their state. With respect to, and you'll see that uh, how wide it is in the number of countries that have either signed it or, wait, or are waiting for ratification or have not signed it. With respect to the United States, we will find that we have not signed the convention, but I am pleased to say that the uh, United States uh, will be signing it uh, uh, now that Senator Obama is our president-elect. He has said he will sign the treaty. So what does the convention say about the internet? States, parties, or governments have the obligation to ensure internet access for persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. By promoting accessibility, which is found in Article 9, 2G, and promoting accessible ICT, or web, to minimize the cost at early stage in design, development, product, and distribution, found in Article 9, 2, 8. Keeping in mind the accessibility provisions of Article 9, states parties under the general obligations of the treaty are required to do a number of things. They include promoting universal design in the development of standards and guidelines, promoting assistive technologies in research, development, availability, and affordability, providing accessible information about new technologies and support services, and to promote training on the convention, and in, it, and in this case, the accessibility requirement for the internet. 
In addition to requiring equal access and accessible web design for persons with disabilities, the convention also addresses accessible web implementation. Looking at Article 31 for statistical and data collection, state parties must collect statistical and research data to assess their implementation of the convention and to identify barriers to that implementation. In addition, the database itself that they collect must be accessible to persons with disabilities using assistive technology. This provision should impact statistical factors for measuring internet penetration for persons with disabilities. At this time, there is a lack of data on their, in on their internet use at home, work, or school. Looking at Article 32, the Convention calls for international cooperation to facilitate research and access to scientific and technical knowledge, to provide technical and economic assistance and enable technology transfer. Accessible web implementation will be supported by these efforts. So perhaps one of the outcomes of the convention is the important role that governments can play in supporting accessibility standards by mainstreaming disability issue. Mainstreaming is a critical approach that enables policies, strategies, and design to, to take the needs of persons with disabilities into account in all stages of policy and standards development. In fact, the convention references mainstreaming in the preamble, quote, as an integral part of relevant strategies for sustainable development. Another important role government can play is to support stakeholder engagement. It is my experience that one key success factor for mainstreaming is the engagement of persons with disabilities that represent cross-disability issues to inform all policy and standard sectors. By actively participating in the development and implementation of policies and strategies for accessible ICT, persons with disabilities can contribute to the determination of the most relevant and appropriate strategies for successful policy and design. Another best practice promoted by the convention is the provision of accessible websites, I'm going to go back, accessible websites, effective communication, and accessible information so that the full participation can be achieved from cross-disability spectrum. Now, as we discussed, this means that websites are designed to be accessible for persons with disabilities using assistive technologies. Today, we have technical web design standards for accessibility that help us to achieve this through the World Wide Web Consortium Web Accessibility Initiative or the United States Section 508 effort. As we will see here today, real captioning can be provided on the web for access to meeting just like accessible online conferencing tools enable persons who are deaf or hard of hearing to participate in teleconferences or conferences. So I do want to point out uh, that there are a number of best practices in procurement of accessible ICT, but I don't have time to fully dis discuss them. So I would encourage you to take a look at three efforts underway in Canada, Ireland, and the U.S. US. In Canada, a web-based application has been developed to deliver accessibility guidelines and standards for use in the procurement process of mainstream ICT products and services. Canada's Accessible Procurement Toolkit is at www.apt.gc.ca. Ireland also has a government accessible IT procurement practice underway. It covers principles of accessible procurement, stages of procurement, and web accessibility at accessit.nda.ie. And finally, another best practice, for example, of government uh, procurement of accessible ICT is found in the United States. Take a look at the Buy Accessible Wizard, which is a web-based application to assist procurers of ICT products and services to comply with the accessible ICT procurement law of the U.S. Section 508. And you would look at www.buyaccessible.gov. I would like to conclude by providing some resources for your consideration as you move forward. First, you may be interested in the second book I have co-authored on Accessible Web. 
It's entitled Web Accessibility, Web Standards, and Regulatory Compliance. It was published in 2006 and contains the best tools for accessible web design by leading experts in the field, as well as my global survey of laws and policies addressing accessible web design. And in 2007, the book was selected for Japanese translation by the chair of the Japanese Industrial Standards Working Committee for Web Accessibility. And we are now moving forward for translation of it into Serbian. Another helpful resource is the handbook for parliamentarians on the convention. It is available free online. It's a comprehensive resource and thoroughly lays out the ICT obligations of states, parties, and the role of government in implementing the convention. And it is available online at www.un.org slash disability. Again, I want to say there are many significant provisions in this treaty that address ICT, which is unusual as, a, as compared to other human rights treaties in the past. And finally, as mentioned earlier, the success of the convention requires both the mainstreaming of disability issues and stakeholder engagement. An excellent resource that discusses how to involve persons with disabilities in the standardization process was published last year by Dr. John Jill of OBE, Chief Scientist of the Royal National Institute of Blind People. And it is, it is also available free online. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. If you uh, certainly are welcome to contact me if you have any further questions or would like to further dialogue on this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, for this enlightening presentation on the UN Convention. Um, so we will uh, try to answer to the question at the end, or as I said, at the Dynamic Coalition meeting. I would like to uh, continue with a second speaker, which is uh, Shadi Abu Zahar from the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. So I'm going to, to change the slides for you, Shadi, as we agreed. So I think you can speak from uh, that, uh, that microphone. So Stefano will be my mouse. Thank you. <laughs> So my name is Shadi Abuzara from, um, I work for the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. I want to, um, while we're setting up, I think you might have unlinked something, Stefana. Yeah. So while this is being set up, I um, want to thank the, op um, the, the ITU um, for uh, organizing this session and for ISOC for uh, the, the captioning and um, also the other partners in the uh, Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, which is, I think, a very interesting opportunity to bring um, um, different partners from across the globe uh, who are interested in promoting accessibility. Specifically, m my presentation um, is, is maybe a follow-on to Cynthia's, um, uh, who, who presented very nicely the human rights aspect of accessibility. Um, this is really a, a more uh, the, the, the technical side of the technical standards in a specific field of accessibility, of ICT accessibility, which is web accessibility. Um, so the, the Web Accessibility Initiative, the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative, um, is a standards-making body um, of um, international and multi-stakeholder participation. Um, it, it, it's, it's a formal, th there's a formal process for how we develop um, um, the, the our standards for web accessibility, uh, which is what I want to introduce. Um, um, and Cynthia explained very nicely the um, user participation and the importance of including users in standardization. And I want to highlight how we address this at W3C. Stefano, next slide, please. So, um, the, the W3C document development uh, process is uh, quite basic in, in, in terms that uh, most of our work, um, um, actually all of our work at the Web Exhibit Initiative is done publicly in public space. Um, so the working group develops something, and the working group itself is a multi-stakeholder uh, group, um, publishes a working draft 
to the world outside, to the public. We do push mechanisms. We contact disability organizations uh, because very often it's difficult for disability organizations and people with disabilities to be part of the working group just because of resources. Um, and then we get those public reviews and comments, and then we or incorporate it into uh, iteration. Next slide. So um, we have um, um, several stages of the document process, um, and this is all available online. Um, th the document starts as working draft, and when the group thinks it's done, it goes into a last call. The candidate recommendation stage is where we do implementation testing, uh, so to make sure that the standards are implementable in practice in the real world. And then there's a proposed recommendation where we get the membership of W3C to sign off uh, and, and to agree to this. And this is actually where the current web content accessibility guidelines is. So very close to the final publishing, which is a W3C recommendation, which is the term that we use for uh, web standards. Next slide, please. So speaking of web content accessibility, so accessibility of the content that is up there on the web, um, and the content could really be anything. It's text, it's images, it's multimedia, video, audio, graphs, and so on. Um, and all this is described how to make this accessible in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the uh, acronym WCAG. Next slide, please. What we should not forget about is the access to this uh, content. So people with disabilities or uh, people use browsers and media players to access the information on the web. And some people with disabilities also use additionally assistive technologies on top of those uh, browsers and media players. So the term that we have in general is the user agent. And they also need to adhere accessibility. For example, they need to provide the captioning. If, if, if the uh, media players do not provide the captioning, there's no point in, in, in doing the captioning in the first place. Um, so there's also accessibility considerations that need to be done in the web software. So that's uh, specified in the user agent accessibility guidelines. Having said that, um, also the production <laughs> is, is important to consider. So the authoring tools and the evaluation tools that developers need, uh, the, the developers use in order to produce the content. Um, one thing that we shouldn't forget about is that those authoring tools need to be accessible by themselves as well. Authoring tools are, for example, content management systems. They are editors. They are wiki pages. All those are uh, tools in which um, we can use to generate content. And if we want to talk about equal participation on the web, we have to make sure that people with disabilities can also contribute to the web, not only be recipients of, of, of the content. So to put it all together, this is the end-to-end -end model that we have at W3C. Um, I will not go too much into the technical details. At the bottom of the image are the technical specifications. So those are the core specifications of the web, like HTML, XML, and so on. On top of these are the three accessibility guidelines I just mentioned for the content, for the authoring tools, and for the user agents. And those three guidelines work in concert to provide an end-to-end -end accessibility from development all the way to um, um, the user consumption side. So basically what I want to say is uh, get involved in accessibility, get involved in, in the standardization process. We really need uh, multi-stakeholder and multicultural um, influences. Um, we really identified the participation of users in our standards development is crucial. Um, and also we identified that there are sometimes language and culture specific issues that um, need to be solved by the uh, specific cultures and languages themselves. Uh, for example, um, in, in my home country, in Egypt, uh, the, the, the Arabic script, there are specific issues with it um, um, in regard to accessibility. Uh, font sizes, for example, are different in um, Arabic script than they would be for uh, Japanese or Chinese or uh, whatever other languages in the world that we have. And thankfully, we have several uh, languages. 
I do want to mention at this stage uh, that we have a policy for authorized translations of W3C standards. So it's possible to get it uh, normative translations, in some cases also regional. So we're talking, for example, about um, a Spanish translation, but also an Argentinian Spanish translation, for example, uh, because different countries and different uh, areas use different terminology uh, to, to express um, 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 terms. And finally, uh, to close, I would like to also mention that the W3C standards are open and royalty free. That means, um, and this was one of also the reasons for the su success of the web, um, is that um, the, the standards are produced and provided openly on the web for download. Anybody can download the HTML specification and produce a, a browser or an authoring tool. And the same with the accessibility guidelines. They're up there, they're open for anybody to use without royalties. Um, and, and this is an important aspect to promote the development of assistive technologies, which is really, really important. Assistive technologies remain to be very, very expensive. Um, and, 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 and this is one of the hindrances for the promotion of accessibility and the deployment for people with disabilities. Um, and, and so we hope uh, that with this model, we can promote uh, the development of uh, open uh, uh, source assistive technology and, 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 and um, um, open source software. And um, yeah, well, to the last slide, just to say thank you. And those are my email uh, addresses, shadi at w3.org. It's also linked, as, as, as Stefano was saying, from the uh, page of this uh, workshop. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shadi, for uh, this presentation and introducing us to the standardization in W3C. Um, next speaker is uh, Jorge Plano from the Argentinian chapter of the HISOC. Uh, he is giving us a presentation on achieving web accessibility laws in developing countries. So, Jorge, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefano. Well, the idea is to talk about uh, web accessibility laws uh, from the viewpoint of uh, uh, underdeveloped countries. The issue is uh, very different in this moment in the development and underdeveloped countries. Supposedly in the developed countries, is the web accessibility is already established. There are laws that uh, uh, since uh, about 2000, uh, in the developed country, in, in the most of the developed countries, have uh, established laws that uh, make mandatory for the governments uh, and, and, and other uh, agents uh, the accessibility of the websites. And in uh, the underdeveloped countries, generally, the, that uh, the, the web accessibility is invisible. We talk about web accessibility, and the people say, "What is this?" And this is this is uh, the difference. Well, I will try to talk. We are talking. About, uh, we are working on uh, web accessibility, uh, trying to get uh, web accessibility law for Argentina since uh, some years, <laughs> and, and uh, I will try to reflect uh, our experience in in this field. Well, this this is a oh, it's in better in the protection. The countries that are um, in gray are countries that ha that have web accessibility laws, and uh, other the, 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 the one in, in clear green uh, don't have laws. Uh, so most of the world don't have laws about web accessibility. Um, well, the first uh, ingredient that you need to cook a uh, web, uh, web accessibility law is at least one uh, senator, representative, deputado, or whatever the name that the uh, legislator have in, in, in your country. Well, it is uh, to, to get uh, one legislator that support that, that this uh, that will be 
uh, uh, to introduce that, that law in the, in the parliament. The natural supporters uh, are the person with disability organization, uh, the blind people organization are the more interested because blind people are uh, the person that, that found uh, most barrier in the, for the access to the web page. Uh, disability advocates, uh, the uh, corporate social responsibility areas and uh, co corporations. Uh, and uh, the disability authority of the country, maybe another na natural supporter of uh, uh, web accessibility law. Um, it is necessary to gain uh, another supporters. That may be the agency regulating uh, government in the uh, the use of information technology in the government. Maybe a, a supporter, the ISP association maybe another supporter. The telcos may be supporters or not. It depends if they see this uh, an increase of, uh, of costs of ease. But the corporate social responsibility areas of the telcos may be uh, uh, doors for, uh, and, uh, for to get the, the, the support of the, of the telcos for uh, this initiative. Uh, who sh another question is who should be included as uh, in that law for the the first is the public administration this is uh, generally accepted that this must be this is a, this is a matter of opinion who should be included no? Uh, the um, private uh, public utilities or private as uh, pri privatized public, public utilities are generally uh, another uh, uh, sector that is considered that m should be included. Uh, NGOs funded by the government, uh, companies or NGOs receiving uh, uh, some kind of subsidies from the government. Another, uh, another uh, is companies offering service to the general public, like uh, not public utilities, but general services like banks or health insurance, hospitals, that uh, private companies offering that kind of services. This is, a, for example, in Europe, in some countries of Europe, uh, this is mandatory. Web is also manda mandatory for the that kind of companies. Um, other opinions say that all government providers, perhaps all government providers, this is more debatable. For example, the, the company that is cleaning, the, the contractor for cleaning the offices, the website, must be accessible. Well, this is the debatable opinion. Um, how to penalize this? The, the um, this issue of doing having not accessible websites the the first generation of laws establish no penalties no no penalties and um, this uh, maybe uh, this is uh, also an issue of uh, opinion <laughs> no how to penalize um, well it, it seems logical that if you don't penalize, you have a law that makes something mandatory but don't penalize, well, it's not effective law. Um, in, it depends on the kind of, if, if it's the, um, the kind, if it's the Anglo-American uh, uh, justice system or the, or the kind of, of, uh, of justice system that is uh, if the perhaps the trials establishing uh, precedents or not, well, this is a very complex situation. I, I am not a lawyer. I am, I am talking about laws, but I am not a lawyer. I am more a as, a as a lobbyist, but that's than a lawyer. I am talking. Well, the, if we, uh, how to penalize? If uh, you are talking about the government, perhaps the public officer might be prosecuted by misconduct. The public, the officing on chairs of the agency, 
because uh, website is not accessible. And in the case of private, private uh, um, companies, um, there may, may be fines. Uh, it is appearing in uh, some European countries, a second generation of web accessibility laws establishing fines for the not uh, having uh, uh, accessibility. Um, well, an another issue for a law is the terms. You know, if uh, for new sites or new pages, generally one or two years is a reasonable time to make mandatory that new pages or new sites will be there is a, a period of uh, training of standards and so on and retrofitting sites or uh, old sites generally the laws are talking about two or three years of uh, of um, the time for the that the the sites, uh, the old sites, uh, will be made uh, accessible. Um, well, possible concerns, possible concerns in the committees of of the of the of the um, uh, legislative bodies of the, the country. How much this cost for the government? This is um, an issue that must be must possible concerns that may. Uh, um, appear in uh, in the committees. Um, maybe negative lobbying of included sec sectors that uh, fear that they will have a high cost of uh, doing the web sites accessible. Well, the, those concerns must be, must be neutral neutralized for the uh, so as the the project might pass the the committees. Well, the, respond, the law must assign two kinds of respons responsibilities. Um, issuing the, techni the technical standards from and the control. Uh, given the need of, of, of have uh, uh, of the uh, sites with, uh, websites with accessibility, you need the technical standards. The natural uh, body for establishing a technical standard is the uh, agency regulating the use of IT in the government. So the, that agency must issue the standards and uh, must uh, make uh, training and support for the government agencies or including the other non-government actors uh, in that are included in the law. The other issue, the responsibility that the law must assign, must assign is the control. The natural actor for this is the dis disability authority of the country. That this uh, disability authority must establish a program for doing a service and perhaps for uh, start legal actions against uh, uh, agencies or companies that don't fulfill the the law. Well, and finally, I wish you a successful lobbying for getting a um, web accessibility law. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for uh, this uh, presentation from the Argentina chapter of ISOC. I would like to introduce to you the next speaker, which is uh, Fernando Botello. Fernando, I'm going to load your presentation on the computer, so just a moment, and uh, then I'll uh, go uh, through the slide when you tell me to, to go ahead. So, presentation is ready, please go ahead, thank you. Now it's on? Okay. Um, Hello everyone, thank you very much to ITU and the entire DCAD team for this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about low and no cost assistive technologies, making large scale deployments feasible. Um, next slide. Yes. Um, w w I'll basically be talking about why is this necessary, why, why my concern with scalability, about, I'll give you some examples of low and no cost assistive technologies 
and I'll also be giving some suggestions as to uh, strategies that might help deployments uh, that should reach large scales. Um, so, large scales. Um, why do we need it? Uh, we have the UN Convention that has been recently signed by so many countries uh, that puts, uh, places or describes a number of rights for people with disabilities uh, that we all hope will become much more than just a law. And the obstacles to make these, these rights a reality uh, are enormous. They cannot be overestimated at this point. Why? We are talking about 600 million individuals that are geographically dispersed, that are as diverse as the general population, and that are overwhelmingly poor and isolated from opportunities for advancement and education and professional uh, inclusion, let's say, uh, inclusion in the workplace. Um, just to give you an example, uh, just choosing a sub-segment of this population, if we focus on, on children who are blind or visually impaired, we are talking about, uh, there's an estimate that 90% of them have no access whatsoever to any education. And the 10% that have some access to education, uh, we are not talking necessarily uh, wonderful uh, levels of, of achievements because of the enormous obstacles that exist. Uh, so why, why is this and, and why, what's the dynamic that currently exists among the population? I'll focus on the blind just because it's so much easier uh, in, in many ways. Um, in the, what happens today with assistive technology and the blind is that NGOs and, and organizations that work to help them beg and plead and fundraise for, uh, to be able to buy the technology. Uh, once they are able to buy this technology, they are really not able to buy a whole lot of it. So as we saw in the previous slide, only 10% or less of the population is served in any way. And when this uh, small group actually learns the technology, they are basically just enhancing their, uh, they are increasing their dependence, uh, dependency uh, on, on, on a technology that they cannot afford. So as soon as the student finishes uh, and moves on to an, a new institution, as soon as a, uh, somebody goes and looks for a job, they realize uh, their skill set is tied up with software that is the equivalent of one or more years of, of work in that position uh, and, and it's incredibly expensive. So a population that already has a number of obstacles is faced with more obstacles rather than less. That's not the kind of, 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 of effect you would want to have with, with technology. And technology is, is supposed to liberate and empower. Um, so let's give you some examples of what kind of technology might actually help instead of hinder the advancement uh, in the education and uh, professional uh, development of people with disabilities. Um, first, some examples related to, to blindness. You have N NVDA, Non-Visual Desktop Access. That's an open source software for the blind that is completely free. It works on Windows machines. Uh, you have Orca, and this is another, another slide, I'm sorry. Uh, so you have Orca, which works on, the, on Linux platforms, reads and magnifies the screen. It's completely free. Next slide. Uh, oh, before I move on to the next slide, you, you have uh, these softwares, they have the ability to read and work with, interact with uh, all kinds of softwares from open office, which gives you uh, word processing, spreadsheet, and so forth, to evolution for email, Firefox for browsing, Pigeon for instant messaging, and so forth. Um, next slide. Physical and other disabilities. Here we have other uh, softwares that are completely free as well. Dasher is one that uh, you might want to consider sending an email. At the bottom of some of my slides, you have the email address IGF2008 
at f123.org. If you send a blank email to this address, you receive further details and links about uh, each of the slides I'm presenting. And Dasher is a piece of software that is worth watching a video demonstrating it. It's a very efficient way of entering information into a computer for people that have motor impairments or for some other reason cannot type. Uh, and, and by the way, this one works on Windows platforms and the Linux platforms as well. You have GOC, which is the GNOME on-screen keyboard, which is a more conventional way of data entry for people that have uh, motor impairments. You have P-Voice, which is for people with cognitive disabilities and, and communication difficulties. So you're able to use uh, images to communicate. And, uh, and there are more, but uh, what I want to focus on is what is the effect that this kind of software can have and how can we deploy it in a way that, is, uh, that reaches as many people as it should. Uh, some of the strategies I want to propose are the following. A government or an NGO or any kind of institution should, uh, above all, increase awareness of, of the existence of these technologies. These are technologies developed by NGOs, by fund, funded by foundations, by volunteers. These are not people that spend a lot of money on marketing. So it's crucial that everybody that knows shares. Another important aspect of this is that when you uh, put out a bid, a request for proposal for a, uh, for a large deployment or even a pilot project, you should always request that the documentation and training material be um, licensed in a way that allows sharing. Uh, Creative Commons is, an, is a wonderful way of, of allowing this. Uh, because that's software for the mind, right? Uh, you need the documentation. You need the, the, the training material to be as freely available as, as the actual software. Um, building a local resources. Uh, it's important that the, language, the, the software, the assistive technology, be able to handle local languages. So here in India, there is a, a group called, an NGO called the Comet Foundation, uh, Comet Media Foundation, and they, they have some very interesting projects involving uh, using Orca on GNOME desktops, on a graphical user interface in the Linux environment that are able to, is able to handle a lot of the local languages. Um, and that's not only uh, cheaper, but it's sustain more sustainable in the long term when you have the talent you need for ongoing development and improvements as technology evolves, you have to have that local. Um, build and cultivate formal and informal channels. What do I mean by this? Everybody that is in touch with the technology you are distributing for their work or for their education should uh, also become an agent of change. I'm not thinking here one laptop per child, I'm thinking here one teacher per child. Every, every child a teacher. And, and what do I mean by that? No NGO, no government is large and powerful enough and has enough resources to reach every single person with a disability in the world. So the strategy here is that every single person with a disability in the world that is able to reach what you are offering, he or she be also able to share that with people they, that, that he or she knows or is related to and might not be in this larger city or may not have the conditions to mobilize him or herself because of tra public transportation difficulties or any other difficulties. So when we are talking about software that can be copied and shared and documentation that can be copied and shared, this is very powerful because you are bringing to a social development uh, arena the kind of tactics that are used you know, in viral marketing, uh, the kind of effect that is studied by finance people in you know, fractional banking. You know, it's basically a multiplicative effect that takes place through a network. Um, innovate, do not transplant. You know, why are we going to take an idea that is based on the level of resources available in a developed country and try to implement that on a developing country? Uh, this is absurd at, at, at many levels and very frustrating because you end up only helping a small minority of the overall population. So why one computer per child? Why don't you give something like this 
a, a USB flash drive that contains the entire operating system, the applications, and the data that the student needs. And each student has one of these and is able to access his own computing environment in the computer lab at school, in the internet cafe, in the neighborhood, or in the library. And by the way, a screen reader as well. So all the adjustments are software, are shareable, and, uh, and are portable. And, uh, and it's $30 instead of $200, as, as so many computers these days. Uh, ecological footprint, much reduced as well. Um, Okay, moving on, uh, avoid path dependency. Like I described when I talked about training people in a very expensive software, assistive technology software, uh, this locks people in uh, into a path that uh, they cannot easily get out of afterwards and you have to you know, uh, have even more resources to then later on teach technologies that can be copied and used and shared easily when they want to move to a new job or a new educational level. And finally, be good if you cannot be perfect. <laughs> what I mean by that is, is that if uh, for a number of cir uh, circumstances or, or situation you cannot request or require that the documentation be free, well, at least you have software that is free and people will find ways of sharing their knowledge and their experience. Um, and, and this applies to, to many other items. But you must have at least software that is not a barrier, but an empowerment tool. Oh, and that's the last slide. I want to thank you for, for the chance to speak to you today. If anybody wants to reach me via email, I'm at fernando.botelho at f123.org is on the slide. And uh, it will be a pleasure to change the world with you. Thank you.